Right. Well, by raise of hands, how many of you expect in the next five years that most of your health care will be done online? Next five years. What about 10 or 20? <laughs> All right. Well, as you're thinking about what does this mean, today we're going to explore the answer to that question. We'll hear more from our speakers on that today. But just to set it up, I wanted to talk about the availability of 5G, connected home sensors, smart health devices. These are new data opportunities for us in healthcare. And in the past, they've not been considered as relevant for medical research. So in this session, we will discuss how the use of AI um, can make sure that we're keeping our health data private and accelerating medical research and ultimately leading to empowered patients and healthier lives. So let's start off uh, with a little bit of an extended introduction before we dive into this topic. Um, so Tim at Anthem, your role is really to help make sure that us consumers are having a great experience and that we're leveraging um, these technologies and how we manage our health. Mm -hmm. And at Doctet AI, where you've been working on a medical research platform, Sam, you've been working with partners like Anthem to leverage AI technology on the edge and for research. And I understand both of you uh, have met before, but before we hear that, tell us a little bit about your personal heartfelt story of what led to Doctet AI and something maybe all of you in the room might be able to relate to with some of your personal health experiences. Yeah, no, so thank you very much for having me today and together with Ted. So um, I've been in tech and science for the last 27 years, but uh, my personal healthcare story, and I'm sure you all have a healthcare story, was with my um, youngest son when he was five years old, 15 years ago. Um, after a severe accident, I found myself in the hospital with my husband and my family. and. I didn't know anything about healthcare. And so I was asked to make decisions about very serious things without knowing anything about it, not understanding the language. Um, my emotional state was in full distress. So all the elements you know, uh, in the situation were really playing against the odds of things uh, moving forward really well. The, the other thing is that um, the, the, you know, in, with chronic disease and, and, and health issues, um, there is something about also when you are a patient not having access to your own information, not owning it, not understanding it, and not being able to connect the dots because the healthcare industry uh, is so fragmented, so siloed, and it has not been designed to share data uh, for the sake of patients. So there was a huge disconnect. But as you can imagine, in 2005, we even didn't have smartphones yet. So what happened is, you know, when the, the, the smartphone appeared and sensors became smaller and cheaper and with the revival of AI, we thought together with my co-founder that there was maybe an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, to build technology, to build an ecosystem that could help uh, people be more connected with their health, improve their health. And the big lesson for me um, having, you know, being a caregiver is that when you're dealing with a chronic disease, uh, your health is a, is a big research project. So how do you connect care and research so that you can accelerate insight and, um, you know, augment uh, engagement? That's great. And Ted, maybe you could elaborate on how you two met. Sure. So <laughs> I had been uh, uh, vice president of software at Apple in 2007 and had been working on iPhone and, and, and such. And uh, Steve uh, Jobs came down with cancer during the 2005-2007 period of time. People became generally known. And it was interesting to watch one of the you know, wealthiest, most intelligent, well-connected people in the world struggle with something that everybody struggles with. And of course, he had certain advantages. But nevertheless, he didn't have, couldn't get answers to fundamental questions like, what is the best therapy for me? You know, you ask five doctors, you'll get 10 opinions. And that kind of of uh, uh, problems uh, that if, it could, if he has that problem, we all have this problem. And so it occurred to me that this was the next great challenge and started you know, talking to, to people and working with uh, Sam and others about what were the exciting uh, opportunities and people who were looking ahead, looking to, to really trying to revolutionize healthcare. And a collection of these technologies of portability, mobile devices, of course, are incredibly important to this. Uh, network connectivity, uh, artificial intelligence, and now federated learning 
all these layers of technology that I think are going to make a huge difference, and they already have. So actually, go ahead and expand on telling us about Anthem. Uh, I'd love to know more on why do you think it makes sense for Anthem to move towards AI and federated mm -hmm. cloud learning? And considering all of us here are, are patients, maybe not members, right. what does this mean for us then? So that's a good question. And so the, the, the exciting part here, and, and why is Anthem, an insurance company, interested in these things? And we think that there's an important role for uh, uh, Anthem to be a coordinator and a funder of these innovations. And this is both to improve care and to lower costs. And this is in, uh, what, one of the things that I think uh, the lessons of the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare has had is that we are now in a position of learning that keeping people healthy is the best way to make money. And that's a, that's a change because, you know, as a payer, right, we were mostly paying for people's uh, uh, illnesses. Now we're paying doctors uh, with uh, uh, value-based care to keep people healthy. And that's a, an important change in the economics. And so, like anything else, right, how do we transition this from a uh, uh, automatic, automated processes to, you know, um, from the current manual processes. So anything today that requires a lot of human intervention, if it can be automated, we think that that's a, a good thing. And then how do we move it from expensive bricks and, and mortar to uh, bits and, and, uh, and algorithms? And that's, I think, is, is the key. And so these are the technologies that are going to make that happen. And if I remember right, would you consider Anthem to be an, is it an AI first? Uh, what's the model there? Tell us yeah. about that. Well, the, the, there's a movement now at Anthem to be digital first. Digital first. That's right. right. How, do, how do we become uh, so that the, and, and people do this anyway, right? Uh, you feel uh, a symptom. The first thing you do is get on Google and Google the symptom, right? You know, is this something I need to worry about? You know, do I have, you know, macosis uh, Peori, right? You know, some some impossible to pronounce thing, and and people need answers, right? And oftentimes the the problem with these digital interfaces is they give you they raise more questions than they answer, right? And so how can we put these things in context using a little bit of expertise to say no, what you have today is just ordinary indigestion, or you have something which you know if it persists and the pain gets really bad, time to go to the emergency room. And so one of the things that we find is we're in a position now where the digital environment can tell people, don't go to the ER, go to urgent care. Don't spend $2,000, spend $100 on an urgent care visit. And that, you know, that's savings both to uh, uh, the, the member, to the, to the business, and to the employer who typically is paying the bills. Absolutely. So we'd love to hear from you, Sam, on what the partnership with Anthem's about uh, maybe you could talk with us a little bit about the goals and the approach of yeah, this, and, and specifically a data trial. By the way, has anyone ever been a part of a, a data trial? Do you know what that is? A data trial. There we go. I'd like to hear about what is a data trial in the case of this partnership. Yeah, so um, I, I would like to, to start with the fact that something um, extremely important is happening right now, and it's... Um, in physics, it's called a momentum, and physics doesn't lie, right? So the amount of data that we are generating is just incredibly huge. So we've been generating, you know, uh, 30 million, you know, uh, your tablets of data in 2018, we're moving to five times that amount for 2025. This is pretty huge. Uh, health data is doubling every 76 days as we speak. So uh, the amount of data, big data, is, is a real phenomenon in, uh, in, um, in healthcare, but uh, fast data with the arrival of, of 5G is also, and so that's in physics, it's mass and, and velocity, that's the momentum. So that's why everybody, that's where growth is. So the opportunities are huge together with mobile and AI. So for us, what we've been working on for the last three years, very concretely, so we've been building modules, AI modules that enable anyone to collect to recollect and reown all our health data and real world data. I'm talking about your medical record, genetic test, lab test, pharmacy, environment, and so on and so on. So what are we, how are we doing this on your mobile phone and in a very safe way because we're putting the AI on the edge. And putting the AI on the edge means that today we are able to have the AI being computed and trained on your device, which is extremely secure, safe, and extremely efficient in terms of latency. You don't need Wi-Fi anymore, which is really, really great. 
So uh, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we have not yet had the opportunity to collect all that real data in one place to try to understand how that connects with each other and what it means for your health, like your phenotype, which is your physical characteristics, together with your genotype, which is what you, you know, are born with, together with your diet and your exercise. I mean, we are all very unique. So that concept of precision medicine that everybody is talking about is really the idea of being more precise in the delivery of healthcare because we understand each of us in a more precise way. So we've developed all these AI modules that enable to um, aggregate all that data coming from different sources on your phone. Once you have that on your phone, we are already able to make some very, you know, very simple but very promising, you know, in the long term predictions. Like it is possible already in healthcare, just based on your age and sex, to kind of you know, give you some level of predictions about you know, health risks and other things. So imagine being able to build new type of databases, including other type of data sources like environment, genotype, uh, microbiome, and so on. So those predictions will be much more tailored to you uh, and give you uh, more precise information. What we have been also building uh, uh, on, on, you know, on our mobile platform is the, the possibility for anyone to join research projects in a very transparent way. So there are research projects out there that we put in the app that are trying to develop predictive models around very specific conditions. So let me give you just one example, one project that we have right now with Stanford that is going to be launched very soon. Epilepsy, all right? So, uh, anti-epileptic drugs. So today, people who have epilepsy and are being uh, treated with medication take a cocktail of two to three medication. And in that specific field, like many other fields, there's a lot of trial and error. So neurologists give you a cocktail of medication not knowing what is working for you exactly and how. Now, those medications happen to be very heavy on the side effects. So before, so sometimes the side effect heaviness of those medications are contraproductive versus the clinical efficacy. So how do we, and also there are also some type of medication you might not be able to digest properly just because of your genetic uh, uh, profile. So there are a lot of information data sources we are not co connecting correctly. Another project we have is about allergies, has been very successful. Uh, we pushed it last year, 2000 participants. So why is it successful? Because we've been able to recruit 2000 participants in less than 10 weeks in a traditional clinical setting that would take months and would cost millions of dollars. So we've done that in 10 weeks, very low cost, where you recruit people and at the same time they collect their information on the mobile. And also it's safe, it's on the edge. Also they know exactly with whom the data is shared, for how long, for which purposes, and it's one-time sharing. So it's full control, which, which is the way it, it should be. And at the end of the day, when all that data is being collected plus the self-reported data, uh, that data goes in a kernel where data scientists are going to build models, predictive models around the endpoints. And all that is being really short-term in, you know, in a few months instead of, of years and costing uh, a lot of, of, of money. So that's, that's the kind of, of, of uh, ecosystem we are building. Data collection, data interpretation, you need bioinformatics pipeline mm -hmm. for genetics and microbiomics, but also you know, building the models. and, and most importantly, using the AI serving core values of ownership, privacy, and safety. So the age matters, and federated cloud learning is instrumental into that because that, that's another concept that really guarantees those values as well. Wanted to double click on the collaboration itself. Sure. I was curious about, maybe Ted, you could share with us the actual collaboration on the data science. You know, we've, you've got medical research happening on all of this. How much collaboration is happening between Anthem and Doc.ai team members? So there, there is the, uh, the, the sensors going off of it, something I'm excited about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the uh, DACA, it's a great partnership between uh, an, an old line insurance company that is uh, uh, you know, in the process of transformation and a very agile uh, startup company in you know, Silicon Valley. And <clears throat> one of the things we've done is set up a research lab in Palo Alto to uh, help create these kinds of innovations and uh, work closely with with partners, and the 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 day to day collaboration is, is that Anthem is a company with uh, fifty million members, and uh, so we we're sitting on this amazing uh, data set that we are allowed to use for doing uh, uh, 
process improvements to healthcare, but which were really very restricted. But a startup company, of course, can give apps out to the world and collect data. Uh, they can, you know, be not a medical company. And so we can, you know, they can uh, uh, develop hypotheses there, which we can then look and observe to see in our data set, does, you know, is it actually borne out in large scale? And then using that kind, those kinds of learnings, can we actually improve the quality of care? Can it actually drive uh, uh, recommendations and insights uh, which we can serve up to our providers to, to make things happen? And so the, the virtuous cycle here is that uh, they can develop um, and do the, the early investigations on, on many important things. And then how does that actually translate into uh, uh, actual uh, actionable medical change? And that's something which uh, we, we can do as part of a being uh, with, our, with our large scale uh, cross -na national provider network. Um, so it's really a, the best of both worlds, and it's a good marriage of, of uh, what Silicon Valley does extremely well and what uh, an East Coast uh, uh, old line uh, Rust Belt data science company can do. Wonderful. And, and actually, I'd love to hear a little bit more. Uh, we have about five minutes, but on the privacy preserving techniques and federated cloud learning, there's many applications for this in healthcare. But before that, just even some of the specifics about the approach that you're taking around those two things. Yeah, so um, federated cloud learning, um, if it delivers on the promise, is, uh, is a game changer. So federated cloud learning has been the first paper were produced by Google in 2017. So we've been following that very closely. And uh, the first production paper were actually this year. And I think we are one of the very few companies in the world who has actually implemented some uh, prototype around that, but basically what it means. So, you know, I started by saying that the healthcare industry has not been designed to share data, right? While it's an industry that is sitting on a ton of data and it's not monetizing the data because that's, now, that's not how the, this industry is monetizing uh, anyway. However, this data is very valuable and we need to have access to that data to have better models. And we need it to accelerate research, we need it to deliver better services, better products and so on. So we really need to liber liberate that data. The problem with data, with data sharing is that even if you encrypt and so on, so, so far, it, even sharing a small sample of data always gives some level of information about the data, about the company. So everybody has been really, really scared and you know, trying not to share data. Federated cloud learning is a new technique that enables whoever owns data to share the data without the data leaving its location. That's one. You don't share the raw data, you share the uh, aggregated and updated models because you share the inferences. And inferences are like mathematical models representing that data. And those updated models go to the cloud and you can do that. It can become a multi-sharing platform where you have different stakeholders sharing data pools. And uh, via the inferences, all the aggregated models get in the cloud, get averaged, globalized, and sent back to all the different stakeholders. So it's still very early, it's still very nascent, but uh, very promising. And it's kind of like voting, right? You, your, your own personal vote is private, but the aggregate uh, count is, is public. And the same thing is true here. And we use that kind of information in order to understand which drug is better for which person. And using that kinds of information, right, we can do better targeting, avoid side effects, understand how things are without revealing any personal health information. We, so we think of this technology as incredibly instrumental to uh, achieving the, the AI vision that we all share. Perfect. And that leads us to 2020, right around the corner. I was just reading some articles uh, predicting what 2020 would be like, and some of them are spot on, some we might be far from. But back to our question in the beginning. How far away are we from doing a lot of our healthcare online? Maybe you could talk with us about 2020 healthcare, and we could wrap it up with some specifics you think uh, in this this particular project that we'll see. So, so today one can have a conversation with a physician over the phone, and so uh, rather than sitting in a waiting room chair when you're feeling miserable, you can actually have a, a wait wait in bed until the doctor can see you now, and. What we hope to do is to turn this around. 
right? Where uh, sort of like the, the book, the patient will see you now. And the idea really is one where we can actually get some of the healthcare uh, prerequisites, you know, uh, what's your name, what's your age, of course, very trivial form filling kinds of things. How do we make that more streamlined? How do we make it so that it's, it, it, you know, you, you feel like you're not answering the same question over and over again? So that's the first little thing. But really what's important, of course, is which of these pieces of information has changed and how do we actually detect that? Mm -hmm. And to make that so that's a, a, a streamlined part of the process. And so uh, the expectation is, is that we will have these, these bots, these doc bots that are our agents that represent. And so we will be launching uh, these kinds of technology in, 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 uh, shortly. Can't wait to start using it. And what do you think specifically on the applications of what you're doing now? You're starting small with, you know, huge potential. Yeah, so huge potential. We're doing really well. We already, you know, Anthem is already using the technologies we have been developing. Um, I think the, 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 the big challenge with healthcare is a um, um, lot of data, a lot of opportunities, but it's a very specific industry with a lot of regulation. Uh, so we have to somehow, you know, comply. <laughs> um, however, what, what is changing, I think, is there is such an opportunity to, more than any other industry, to, to totally personalize the experience and to make the experience so efficient because the data is there via the claims, the medical record. I mean, it's, 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 it's just at the tip of our finger. We just have to unleash and, and be good at what we're doing and really create experiences that people, people want to use because that's the other challenge with health. How do you how do you make the experience very exciting and you know, engaging? So we, we talked about two challenges just now. Maybe you could close this up before we take questions with another challenge or learning that might be helpful for everyone who's considering this for their organization. <clears throat> so, so one of the, the, the biggest challenges we face, of course, is how do we make these kinds of standards spread across? So um, one of the, the trends in, in, in the healthcare world has been this massive centralization. You know, Sutter Health, for example, is in, here in Northern California. Um, in every part of the country, there is one or two uh, companies that have aggregated at huge cost and expense. But now we're kind of reaching the limits of what's possible. So I think one of the big issues here is how will these different institutions interact? And once again, federated cloud learning. So how do we actually train a model, not, a, not just in the phones, but across the multiple institutions so that we can train a model that's useful here at Sutter Health and then pass it over to UCSF and pass it over to, um, uh, to Dana-Farber in, in, in the Northeast and Moffitt in the South and Geisinger in Pennsylvania. How do these large institutions collaborate? They don't want to trust each other. They feel they have obligations to their members and to their shareholders and, 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 and other entities that they have to protect and not share their individual patient data. And federated learning, I think, is an answer to that, even at that macro scale. Amazing. Well, why don't we take some questions now? Someone will come around with a microphone. Thanks. I think we have one right here. Uh, okay, I have a short question, uh, followed by a longer one. Uh, the short question is, are you folks contemplating uh, a question I've asked Ted in the past, integrating, you think of all the genomic information, think of the biomic uh, omic information, and then go all the way to EMR, uh, to ICU real-time information. So is that something uh, that doc that I has a capability for, or is this something that together you're thinking about? I think, I think this is something we're beginning to evolve into existence, and we are contemplating the scale of this. And there's so much more data, obviously, at, at that level, right? Uh, when you have all these medical machines that you're hooked up to in the ICU generating you know, megabytes and petabytes of data, right, that needs to, to be aggregated and summarized, right? That's not something where we're going to just have you know, enormous pipes to uh, up to uh, you know Amazon or Google, right? So, so we need to, to we need to have an architecture that makes that happen, and that's uh, part and parcel of, of what needs to come into existence. Fabulous. And you can play with the Doc AI app. You can already not the ICU part, of course, but you can already via the Doc AI app import all that information on your phone. So, oh, medical really? record. Oh. We've integrated with Apple Health, Human API. You can import your twenty three and Me. Um, DNA ancestry, so we can build other importers. Pharmacy, uh, we have importers for that. Mm -hmm. And we've built computer vision models, so anything that we can replace by 
a neural net mm -hmm. using picture or video, we will. So today we have two models. One is for your phenome. You take a picture and that picture predicts your age, height, mm -hmm. weight, BMI, and so on. We have another model for mood. So a picture that predicts your mood. So, and we have another model for medication. So you take a, a picture of your medication pill box and whoop, it starts in, that's NLP, natural language processing. So anything we'll be able to replace, replace with picture, video, and voice, we will, because that's, that's the mm -hmm. state of the art of collection. You don't want people to type okay. anymore. That's and I'm going to, oh, I'm gonna let Kevin decide if we can continue with yeah, the question. Yeah, I think it's we'll just leave it there. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. very good. So let me go to the next question. You know, you're both referring to the fact that uh, there's a tricky issue, right? I've got 10 hospitals and the demographics in each are different, right? So if I'm going to uh, pass parameter, I'm going to do federation and do parameter sharing, then unless I know the context of the data that came in, and uh, which is partly reflected in the parameters, it could really cause a lot of confusion if you want to share, right? Because you think of a, like uh, any Bayesian hierarchical model where you're messing up the parameters, right? So I'm sort of curious about how this whole federation idea would work if you're doing parameter sharing. Uh, well, there of course has to be standardization and scales and, and such, but part of it also is, is learning about uh, and training, having one of your priors be the, er the, pr the previous learnings and errors you've seen from similar systems. So just as you need to know what kind of machine you had that it's being come from in order to calibrate it. And so uh, that's, that's an important piece of, of how one can do mixed model representation. And I'd like to invite you to stay for a few minutes if you, Ted and Sam, don't mind taking a couple more questions at the end. I think we have to wrap up the session itself, but we can do that and continue. Well, thank you all for thank being you. part thank of this you. discussion. Thank you.